now to current events. We saw that horrific Islamist attack in Russia, mm. saw 137 people gunned down, including three children. Another 182 people were injured. Uh, the death toll there was horrific. Since then, we've seen the capture of the four suspects and the torture they've been subjected to by Russian forces with uh, one having an ear cut off and fed to him, another having um, electric uh, shocks given to his genital area. I mean, the brutality is, mm. is, is, is horrific as well. And Douglas, I know this is going to be a unpopular opinion, but perhaps I wouldn't be saying this if it was my family member who'd been murdered, but this disturbs me greatly and the reaction to it disturbs me greatly. There, there seems to be really not much condemnation of this torture. Is torture ever justified? No, I, d I don't think it is. Uh, but I, I think that what you see is just the operation tendencies of the FSB. Mm. This is how the Russians operate. But again, it's one of the things that people should remember when they're forever castigating the West. You know, everyone's always, you know, all these people who, who go around saying, you know, war crimes about the Israelis, genocide, uh, war crimes in America, torture, and all this sort of thing. This is a country, Russia, which actually does do that and actually does believe in it. And, and it's, proudly, on and proudly, camera. Exactly, there's, it, there's video footage of all this. Exactly. They're, and they're not going to bow to... I mean, you know, they, maybe a, a mob can get together a protest group later uh, in Melbourne about this, but I doubt it <laughs> exactly. will, you know, but, but, because the Russians don't listen. They don't listen at all. what about the reaction? Because from otherwise decent people, they seem to have no issue with this. And I know we're talking about monsters. I know we're talking about men mm. who gunned down over 100 people, including three children, but uh, the justification for torture, yeah. that worries me. That sure. worries me about where we are. Well, I think, look, I think, that, I think that, look, the, I mean, these terrorists uh, are obviously, you know, the lowest of the low lives. So the, mm. I mean, to do that, to go into a, a shopping centre and a theatre and start gunning people down, we've seen it elsewhere. We've seen it in London. We've seen it in Paris, you know. Uh, we've seen it, sadly, around the world. Um, and it's it's inevitable that there is rage in people's hearts about this, and there's even more rage in the West because our governments tell us we shouldn't be allowed to feel rage. No. We can't uh, even condemn it. We had the Manchester bombing, yeah. and, and there was almost an immediate uh, uh, drive against yeah. Islamophobia. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's always the same, always yeah. the same. But, but, you know, the thing is, there, there, there is... When somebody does something, when a group of people do something like ISIS uh, appeared to have done in Moscow, uh, of course, there's a sort of feeling of vengefulness and revenge. Now, in the West, uh, we would hope that we would prosecute that uh, that revenge as carefully as possible, and that it would be legal, that it would go through the law courts if the people are captured alive. Um, but in other theatres, they'd be killed in operation and and and, and during the attack and else, uh, you know, other things. Um, it's just that, you know, th that is a, a, an inevitable tendency to want to have revenge after that. Uh, but, I mean, the fact that in Russia that revenge extends to torture, they say, is not at all, not at all a surprise in Russia. But, but uh, you know, I mean, I, th I think you can, you can want there to be no pity for the terrorists no. without encouraging them to be mutilated by the Russian troops. I mean, it's just... Now, before you go, I've got to ask you about the US. Uh, we're seeing the political persecution, prosecution of Donald Trump. Uh, they've been trying to take his assets. Uh, mm. Today there's been a development there with the, with the bond being reduced dramatically and he's saying that he'll be mm. posting that new amount. I think it's 175 million US. How do you see this uh, effort to get Trump before mm. he can be re-elected? It, it seems uh. to be a determined effort from, from the Democrats and their lawmakers mm. to politicise the justice system. And it really has a dangerous effect. You look at some of the polling now, trust in the US justice system is at record lows. People yeah. do not trust the system. Well, it's a very interesting thing that because, of course, a, lo um, a lot of Americans didn't trust the justice system already. Um, I mean, the conviction rates in the US courts, for anyone who's been through them, are astronomically high. Almost Beijing-like, but not quite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's teetering on 99%, on, uh, you know. And, uh, and so a lot of Americans who've had experience of that um, already distrusted it. Then you've had the sort of super politicization of things like the Supreme Court. Um, and and, and then, then the Trump uh, uh, um, uh, persecution. I do think it's a kind of persecution. I have plenty of criticisms of Donald Trump. But if you wanted to um, 
make sure he wasn't elected again, then run a really good candidate against him <laughs> and highlight the things that he did in his term of office that you disagree with. Mm. Most people, I think, in America can see that this is a form of endless persecution against Trump. It certainly looks like that. These, and this way of sort of trying to ruin him financially just looks like the final sort of, you know, the final turn of that dial. And I think a lot of people will see it as being cruel and unusual. I think it's only helping Trump, though, oh. you know? I mean, as you say, I, I'm not sure that outside America people are quite prepared for this. You know, the polls that you've seen and I've seen that say that he's likely to win against Biden later mm. this year. I mean, personally, you know, I have um, I have just about enough existential energy to, uh, you know, cover various wars and things. I'm not sure if I have the existential energy this time, Rita, to cover Trump-Biden part two. I, we last met in New America, yes. in New York, in Trump-Biden uh, round one. I don't know. I mean, those, those guys might be there for round two. You might be there for round two. I, I think I might be just propping up the bar, exhausted by that. I, I'm not sure. It, this is going to be brutal, Rita. Oh, it is absolutely going to be brutal. But we've seen the Biden administration reverse course on Israel. And, and mm. a lot of the conjecture there is, well, it's because they're trying to hold on to those swing seats, Michigan, mm. Minnesota, where there's large Muslim populations who are very upset with the Democrats for mm. standing with Israel. How do you see that? How is the Biden administration going to balance that, the, that supporting their ally, but also making sure they don't lose those, those uh, well, crucial a, swing seats? There's a very interesting thing that's gone on uh, in the last few days which people haven't noted, which is whilst the rhetoric has ramped up against Israel from the Biden administration, there's been a new uh, package of arms for Israel from the administration. Now, that's very interesting. I'm very pleased that that's the case because I think Israel should, should be allowed to win its war against Hamas and destroy Hamas. Um, but it, it's very interesting that they're doing this two-hander, two effectively. Mm. The sort of public statements and then what they're actually doing. Uh, I mean, you know, David Cameron, Lord Cameron to us, uh, uh, he, he's just said that, you know, if Israel doesn't do what Lord Cameron wants, then he might stop arms shipments to Israel from Britain. Britain doesn't make a significant number of our amount of arms anyway. So, I mean, it's, it's a sort of rather grandstanding thing to do. But it is interesting, that difference between the rhetoric and the reality uh, uh, from Biden. Um, I would just say, you know, um, uh, the Biden administration has been a pretty good friend to Israel during this, but uh, they, they, do, they are worried, it seems, about their polling in Minnesota and so on. I, you know, I understand it. I would just say that, you know, I mean, Rita, if, if, if Australia was at war and, uh, or, or no, let's put it the other way around. Let's say if America was at war and it wasn't going down all that well among some people in Australia, I would not expect the Australian prime minister to pick up the phone to the president and say, now, look, you've got to, you've got to halt your war <laughs> because some of our voters in Melbourne are displeased with it. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't expect that from an ally. No. I mean, the job of an ally is to be supportive to you in your hour of need. And God knows it's an hour of need in Israel. Uh, and I would hope that America would stand by Israel as it finishes its war against the terrorists, as I would expect people to stand by this country if this country suffered a, a similar outrage to that which uh, Israel suffered on the 7th. Douglas Murray, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time this evening. Terrific to see you in person.